How you doing out there? Thank you so much for stopping by over here, Pippa Love View. Thank you, new viewers, you returning viewers, and you subscribers. Appreciate it. Today, I have a few minutes, so I want to talk about some R&B divas, but I want to talk about whose version I like best and why. So let's just go ahead on and get it started. Well, we have over here Mickey Howard and Kiki Wyatt. Now, let me just first of all say, when it comes to re-recording a song, <laughs> sometimes I don't understand why another artist, male or female, would choose to remake a song, especially after an artist put his or her stank on a song. Promise you, I don't know why. I know we love songs and we want to sing them to, you know, pay tribute to that artist or just record it again. If it was a hit for that artist, maybe it could be a hit for you as well sometimes. But I'm saying to myself, some songs are best left alone. For example, Patti LaBelle's If Only You Knew, I don't care who you are. You shouldn't touch that song. Like, it, it's just what it is. You are always going to come up short. It is what it is. Even if you even if that artist does a fantastic job, you're going to still come up short. So let's talk about Kiki White and Mickey Howard. <sighs> Mickey Howard definitely put her stank on this song. Yes, she did. I'm telling you, I just love it from beginning to end. There are definitely no down spots within this song as far as, you know, kind of like you check out of a song like this version keeps you from beginning to the end, especially from the very first lyric. Uh, experience is a good teacher. You know you are about to learn something when a song starts out like that. And it takes someone like me to know. And what I like about this song as well is that in the middle of the song, she kind of gives her testimony you know, about how she fell in and out of love, and now she's in love under new management. I like it a lot. That was it. I mean, and then she ends the song like no other. Like, she does it in Nikki Howard's style, and she stayed true to that. So I'm saying to myself, like, Kiki, are you really and truly serious about doing this record? And then sometimes an artist will probably go into the studio redo a song and say to themselves, well, or the producer, let's kind of, you know, tamper with it. Like, let's not do it just like that one, or let's change up the production of it. You know, music has changed. We got these new way of recording and so on and so forth. And they try to do it that way and they come up short. Nothing about Kiki Wise version I like at all. I'm just saying it. I just don't. And having said that, of course, Mickey Howard wins in this case. Not to say that there's a competition between these two divas or any of the divas I'm about to re uh, cover. I'm not saying that at all. I just don't understand why Kiki White, as wonderful of a singer she is, thought that she was going to touch Love Under New Management. Woo, moving right along. All right, now, you, if you know me, you know how I feel about my favorite singer, songwriter, and producer, and musician, the one with the number one hit in the gold and platinum plaques. I mean, she's been recorded by, I mean, people from R&B all the way up into hip hop. She's been recorded, her music has been recorded by the Osley Brothers all the way up to Jay-Z. We're talking about Angela. Wimbush, all right? So you know how I feel about Angela Wimbush. I love everything about her. And having said that, she recorded or re-recorded her song that she wrote for a group by the name of Alton McLean and Destiny. Angela Wimbush re-recorded I've Learned to Respect the Power of Love. And we all know that song is definitely a number one R&B hit for two weeks on the charts in 1985, I believe, by Stephanie Mills. So I know what you're saying. Stephanie Mills wins hands down. Well, that might be true, but in my opinion, and because I love Angela Wimbush so much, I like her version. And I'm going to stick with it. It is what it is. Yes, I'm telling you. I'm saying Angela Wimbush wins because I just like her as an artist, okay? It is what it is. 
This song has taken a life of its own. As I said previously, it was written by Angela Wimbush in, let's just say, depending on if you ask Angela or not, <laughs> Renee Moore, <laughs> her songwriting partner at the time, whom she says he must have wrote that song in his sleep. It is what it is. We already know about the breakup between or the uh, professional split between Angela Wimbush and Renee Moore back in the mid and late 80s. Having said all of that, the song was recorded by Alton McClain and Destiny. Then Stephanie Mills recorded it, made it a number one hit. Angela Wimbush recorded it, re-recorded it again. Then Stephanie Mills took the song and made it out of a gospel song on her gospel album. And now today, you can find these two divas. If you ever go to a Stephanie Mills concert, you can find these two divas sometimes showing up and singing the song together, especially when it's time for Angela Wimbush to show you how she can hit those four octave notes. I'm here to tell you, I love it every single time. I'm still pushing for these two ladies to go into the studio and record this song together. I mean, go ahead on and just bring this song back to life for us one more time. Angela Wimbush and Stephanie Mills. I'm looking forward to you two recording this song. I want to I want to hear it. Yes, I do. Let's do that for 2023. How about that? But anyway, having said all of that, Angela Wimbush now sings this this song in her live shows and is more of a testimony to her uh, uh to God about her life and all the things that she went through and has gone through. So anyway, I like Angela Wimbush's version better, but I understand more people probably going to vote for Stephanie Mills. And it's what it is. These two ladies are friends uh, professionally in real life. It is what it is. We're moving on from that. Yes, we are. Now, we you probably don't remember this. Frankie, Frankie Beverly and Mays have, have a song, Joy and Pain. The lady here, her name is Donna Allen. You probably don't remember this, but I'm here to tell you, check it out. Donna Allen's version, especially the dance version of Joy and Pain. Now, depending on what publications you're reading, some publications say she went to number one on the R&B charts uh, for her version of Joy and Pain. Other publications say she uh, went to number three. It doesn't matter. She was definitely in the R&B top five with her version of Joy and Pain in 1988. Baby, I'm here to tell y'all, Donna Allen put her stank on that song. It's what it is. I love her version. I do. Like both versions, but right now, Donna Allen, she, she, she changed the flavor up. She kept the true essence of the song, but she changed it up just a little bit in the latest soars throughout this record. I mean, Donna Allen can sing, you guys. The lady can sing. You might remember her first record. I think it was a song called Talk About Serious. Y'all remember that song, Talk About Serious? Anyway, moving right along, Donna Allen. To me, Donna Allen wins in this category. Now, you probably don't know this as well. When I found this out years ago, it was years ago when I found this out, like when the song came out, I was shocked that you put a move on my heart is not an original song. It is not. To me, that's a remake. Who did it first? Misha Paris. Do you guys remember Misha Paris back in the late 80s? Could have been 88, maybe 87. Misha Paris, who had a song I called My One Temptation. Yes, the lady was making such headway and doing such a great job as far as making a good impression, you know, in the music industry. And I think she's from the UK. Well, anyway, doing so good. Guess who wanted to produce her? Anita Baker. That's right. Never got around to doing it. I don't know why, but Anita Baker definitely wanted to work with Misha Paris. Having said that, she has a song, Misha Paris, on her album, You Put a Move on My Heart. Same song written by Rob Temperton, right? I'm saying that correctly. He is the guy who, of course, have all those big hits with um, Michael Jackson. I think he's a member of Heat Wave, correct? Well, anyway, so when Quincy Jones, what is the name? Q's Juke Joint. It was that album, right? It wasn't back on the block, no. 
back on the block is the one with Tevin Campbell and uh, Tomorrow. So his record um, Q's Juke Joint and Misha Paris, not Misha Paris, I'm getting trying to get it right, you guys. Just bear with me. Tamia shows up on Q's Juke Joint singing You Put a Move on My Heart. And the connection is, is that it's a Rob Temperton song. And of course, Rob Temperton and Quincy Jones has worked together. And what I like about what Quincy Jones did, Quincy Jones with this work, he kind of stepped it up just a little bit as far as the production is concerned. He didn't change any of the essence of the song at all. You know, that could be, you know, because Rob Temperton and it's just such a great song. Misha Paris does a wonderful job with the song, but vocally it is what it is. Tamiya soars throughout the entire track. And that's what I like about it. But you would definitely like both versions production wise. It's just that Tamiya, she puts that stank on it. And now after Tamiya put her stank on it, it's like the song belongs to her. It is what it is. In the case with Nikki Howard, y'all, they, they go around putting their stack on these songs. Now y'all need to leave them alone once they get these songs funky. You know, leave it alone. That's why they stack them up. So you'd be like, mm-mm, mm-mm, can't test that. Can't test it. <laughs> I'm telling y'all. All right, moving right along. Woo! Prince and Melissa Morgan, Do Me Baby. Y'all already know who I'm. It's hands down, you know where I'm going because we're all about R&B divas over here. Yes, we started talking about soul men as well, but Melissa Morgan wins. You guys know that. I mean, again, Melissa Morgan puts her stank on the song. She goes, mm. she gets it funky. You can't touch it. So if there's someone out there who tried to even touch Do Me Baby after Melissa Morgan put her funk on it, I don't know what to tell you. You need to leave these songs alone when they put their funk on it. Just go ahead on and get you a hit. An original hit. I say, if you want to record the songs, go ahead on and record them, but record them in your live shows. Sing them in your live shows. We don't need to, you know, if you can't make it funky. Yeah, I said funky, not funky. Funky. Yeah, I know what I said. But anyway, Prince version is all right for the time. But Melissa Morgan made history, baby. So we're going to go with Melissa Morgan version. We like it. It's definitely very soulful. And also, too, here's what I want to say about Prince. Now, I know it's going to get a little controversial with me talking about Prince in this way. Yes, he has left a wonderful legacy of music behind. This discography is just off the chain. But here's what I'm going to say about Prince. I think Do Me Baby was around the early 80s. Now, just my opinion, it is what it is. You don't have to argue with me about it, but if you want to leave a comment about it, it is what it is. You know, when Prince first came out, Prince was a one-man show. Like, he sung, he played all the instruments. I think he produced it. I think it, Prince probably even engineered his own projects, you know, back in the day, like he did everything. And unfortunately, <laughs> Prince to me didn't have a sound or an identity until he started working with the revolution and the new power generation. It is what it is to me. And so I think at this time, I think the revolution just came into play. So now they're trying to figure out what his sound is. And yeah, I'm sorry. Prince, he's a good artist, but at the end of the day, Prince surrounded himself with some great musicians. That's how he got the sound he has now. Like there are certain songs now in Prince's catalog. I'm here to tell you, you guys should not touch because he done fucked them up. You know what I'm saying? But now, Do Me Baby is definitely a song he didn't put his stank on because he was still trying to discover himself as an artist. So that's why I'm saying, you know, it is what it is. Like, try to sing a door if you want to and re-record it, whoever you are. And I'm going to say, I'm going to look at you like, mm -hmm. all right, good and terrible. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> who we have next? You probably don't know who this artist is. Um, and I always pronounce her name incorrectly, her last name. But I know her first name is Cindy, the lady on the other end of Reg Regina Bell here. Is it Cindy Mazel? Cindy Mazelli? I can't never pronounce her name correctly. Or I've never heard her last name pronounced. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But let's just say Cindy Mazel, I'm going to say it. She is right there at the same level as an artist like Lisa Fisher as far as background singers. You know, like back in the 80s, you had 
like Lisa Fisher, Tawatha, A.G., Cindy. Uh, what's that lady name? She's married to, oh gosh, she's married to Will Downing. Oh, her name is going to come to me in a minute. Audrey Willer, that's it. Audrey Willer, all of those singers back in the day, like they were background singers, like an in-demand background singers. So Cindy Mazzell is right up there. Like if you was able to read liner notes in the back of album covers and all that stuff, then you would definitely see Cindy's name somewhere around. Anywho, also when Cindy Mazzell and Lisa Fisher are singing background on the same song. I can never tell who is who singing. I can never do that. Even when Cindy and Tawadeh's G are on the same track. I'm like, but it sounds so much like Lisa Fisher. Anyway, moving right along. Cindy Mazzell has a song out first called I Had Enough. I Had Enough. Regina Bell redid it as well. I Had Enough. It's kind of a tie. It's kind of a tie. Like, Again, Regina Bell kept the essence of the song. She didn't change it at all. She just got up and she sung it. You know, I don't think she was trying to just put her stank on it. It was probably was like, well, here's a song you probably want to see. The way in which it's presented to us is what I'm saying. And she's, she sings it. She does a great job. But she don't put a funk on it. So... You know, not like Baby Come To Me. I wish somebody would show up and see, try to see Baby Come To Me and re-record it. Regina Bell put her funk on it. Like, it's funky. You can't touch it. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, these two ladies, love them both. I'm going to say it's a tie. It's a tie. No one pretty much outdid the other one. So it is what it is. All right. All right. I know. I know. I know. I know. So you going to... I'm going to lose some of y'all, either way it goes. Some of you Whitney Houston fans, <laughs> some of you Isley Brothers fans, I don't know. So we're talking about Whitney Houston and the Isley Brothers, for the love of you. <sighs> I know, I know, I know. It's, it's, I know, I know. Whitney, I know. We give it to you, Whitney. We, 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 we're not taking anything from the Isley Brothers, but we're going to give it to Whitney. Now, that falsetto that Ron Osley has, I'm here to tell you it is what it is. I mean, this man is smoother than smooth when it comes to that falsetto. It's just what it is. And gosh, I mean, he just does such a great job when it comes to recording, you know, songs. And we definitely like Ron Isley over here. We might talk about him later. But anyway, but it's something about Whitney's version to me. Well, I guess I'd rather have an R&B diva sing it. <laughs> to me, you know what I'm saying? Like, I like, you know, a certain kind of belting when it comes to a song. And Ron Osley is not belting it out like Whitney Houston is doing it. Whitney Houston is putting little effort into this song, but it's just something about her version that I like better. And I guess it's just her, her tone, her approach to it, her singing style. Like, it's not the falsetto sound. So, uh, yeah, I know, you guys. It's what it is. Um, there are certain points in... Whitney Houston's version that I could do with that. I think I hear birds whistling or some kind of whistling in the song or whatever. And I'm like, okay, eh, I can do without that. But one thing that I like for sure about Whitney Houston's version is when she vamps it out, the ad libs at the end. Like I love her approach to it. Ron is pretty much consistent throughout the entire track. Whitney livens it up just a little bit. So Whitney, you get it right. You out, you 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 put your you put a little stack on it. You put a lot of stack on it, but you put enough to make it your own, right? Mm -hmm. Listen, you guys, I know, I know, I was shocked myself. You know, I just found out this year. I didn't know that Dion Warwick was the original. Uh, artist for the song, No One in the World. You know, the one that's a hit record for Anita Baker, No One in the World. 
When I found that out, I was like, what? Well, you would probably be surprised at who I am going to say. Version is better. But let's just say it this way. So there I was, I was looking down social media, you know, didn't think anything about it. And I see that Dion Warwick's uh, uh, page pops up. I was like, oh, and I see the title, it says no one in the world. And so for one, I was about to pass by it, but something said, no, wait a minute. The title is too far similar to Anita Becker's title. You got to check it out. So I did, I clicked on, you know, the link. I turned the volume down because I didn't want to hear it in the beginning. <laughs> And so I looked at the information and I saw the songwriters. I said, this is definitely the people who wrote Anita's song, No One in the World. So then I turned the volume up and it's definitely Anita Baker. No one's in the world, no one in the world. And so I said, let me listen to Dion. Let me finish listening to Dion Warwick's version. Just between me and you, this is what I'm just gonna say. I didn't know, and y'all gonna probably trip out about this one. I didn't know Dion Warwick could sing, sing, you know. <laughs> like, when I was listening, I was like, wait a minute, I was like, Dion is trying to go there. I was like, okay, Dion, you, okay, sing Dion with your bad self. And vocally, I'm going to say it's a tie. What I like, what Michael J. Powell, the producer of No One in the World, on Anita Baker's album, Anita Baker's album, he kept the true essence of the song. He didn't change anything. All Anita Baker did was just go in and kept the same vocals, the vocals approach that Dion Warwick has. So the way you hear Anita Baker seeing no one in the world is the same way that Dion Warwick sung no one in the world. Now, for those of you who know Dion Warwick and her approach to a song, you're like, Dion ain't singing like that. Well, Dion was singing like that. And the only difference is the production. Dion Warwick's version is more pop, more middle of the road, where Dion, uh, Anita Baker's version is more, I guess, kind of R&B, a little bit more soul, the production of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you towards the end, I'm like, shoot, Dion Warwick, you got a fan fan over here. I wish you would have saw, maybe Dion, if you saw more like that, you would probably had a more people flocking towards you from, you know, the urban community. I say it that way. Mm -hmm. But anyway, moving right along. I know some of y'all are going to go like, whoa, like I know. Escape has been in the news, y'all, so much as far as in these YouTube streets, I understand. But <laughs> they have come up over here. Who can I run to? Uh-uh. I'm sorry. I, I know a lot of people probably want to say that Escape did a better version than uh, the Jones girls. And I know the Jones girls are probably saying, yeah, thank you. you thank you for you know, re-recording our song, redoing it, expanding our fan base, you know, to a new generation of people. We appreciate it, so on and so forth. But I'm pretty sure Shirley is over there. Shirley Jones. I think she is the only remaining member of the Jones Girls, I think. Yeah. But I'm sure Shirley is probably saying, and <laughs> behind closed doors, and help us to do better than me. You know, have you ever thought about that? How some of these artists out here, you know, the old school artists, you know, be like, she, she ain't do a good, better job than I did. I know she don't think she showed me up. But anyway, I just like the Jones Girls version better. Um, but but I must say that Escape definitely did win me over when they recorded Who Can I Run To. But now when I want to hear the song, I go to the Jones Girls. It's just what it is. Uh, they kept the true essence of the song. They didn't try to change it up or anything like that. No, no. 
it is what it is. We like who can we who can I run to? We do. And it is what it is. Moving right along. All right, you probably don't remember this group. Well, I'm sure you all remember the barge. Okay, but I'm talking about the girl group. You probably don't remember this girl group, Jomanda. Do y'all remember Jomanda back in the day? Uh, I think their biggest hit eventually became, I think, a song called Got a Love for You. Is that it? Well, anyway, I had this particular album. It's probably actually over here somewhere, but anyway. They re, uh, did a cover of the, the Barges I Like. And it's an up-tempo version. Like, you know, Jamanda is a house group, uh, a girl group, but they're a house group. And I've liked them from the very beginning. Anywho, I like Jamanda versions better because whenever I hear the Barge's version of I like it, you know, I like it. It's just that I don't like the production of it. You know, the time, the instruments and all that stuff and how they put the song together, a great song. And so when Jomanda spiced it up a little bit and made it a dance track, I was like, okay, I can get into this one, you know. So anyway, it is what it is. I know some of you guys out there probably say, no, we like the Barge's version better. Well, I'm telling you, go check out Jomanda. Jomanda, J-O-M-A-N-D-A, Jomanda, these girls. It would have to be, when did they record this song? It would have to be in between 1992 and 1994, Jamanda. I don't have time to look it up, but it's definitely within that time frame, you know, uh, when they recorded the song. All right. Woo! I know I'm going to lose some people. I know I'm probably going to get some tomatoes and watermelons thrown at me for this one. It is what it is. We got Riri, <laughs> Aretha Franklin in, in Vogue, the original In Vogue, Terry Ellis, Maxine Jones, Dawn Robinson, and Cindy Heron, the ladies of In Vogue, giving them something he can feel. That's it. I'm just going to tell you how it is. It's just what it is. I don't know what else to tell you. I know some of you guys out there are probably looking at me with a raised eyebrow, probably saying, what is he about to say? I like In Vogue's version better. And it's not because everybody, you, you have to know by now, if you watch me enough, I am an In Vogue fan and I am an Angela Wimbush fan. And I'm not saying that I like In Vogue version, In Vogue's version, because I'm just an In Vogue fan. Mm -mm. That Dawn Robinson, I don't know what she did. Because from my understanding, I think she had to do a couple of takes of this song. Because Tommy and Denny, the guys who are the founders of the group and who produced the track on their Funky Divas album, I think that was kind of critical of her of their vocals on giving him something he can feel. So they had to re-record it. But anyway, Dawn definitely does a better vocal version of giving him something he can feel. I'm sorry. She blew Aretha Franklin out the water. And I know that's the part that's going to, people are going to say, she did what? She outsung Aretha Franklin? Well, think about it for a minute. There are some songs of Aretha Franklin's where she didn't put her stank on. She just sung them. She ain't, she ain't put a stink on it. You know? Now, if you talk about Mary, don't you weep and free will, love and love and, 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 and what you call it? Rock a lot and, and, and what's the other song called? Jumping Jack Flash and jump to it and get it right and all of those songs like Who's Zooming Who and In Another Night. Like, if you was talking about those songs, then I would say, yes, Aretha put a stank on it. I don't know. When it comes to giving him something he can feel, I guess she just wasn't feeling it. You know, she sung it more in a bluesy type way. You know, it was more of a, a, a of a of a talking type of approach. And Dawn does the same thing, but I think for me, Dawn does more singing of the song. She kind of kept the true essence of or the approach that Aretha Franklin had with the song, but it's definitely not a song that I guess you sing, sing. 
but it's, it's more like a talk scene, but Don does more singing or the ladies of Invo sings, do more singing on the song, like even the background vocals, they sing more. Whereas it just seems like Aretha Franklin and the whoever was doing the background vocals are just, you know, sitting there like kind of like talking it out. What I do like about Aretha Franklin's version is that towards the end, oh my, I like the end. I like the way Aretha Franklin ends it, the background vocals and all of that stuff. Like, I love it. Now, I love that part of the song, but to me, in Vogue, Don Robinson, Don Robinson, they did it. They, 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 yeah, they did it. It's what it is. Moving right along. I know. <laughs> we're 30 minutes in, and I'm trying not to keep these videos 30 minutes long, but we're 30 minutes in it. But here's, <laughs> we already know it's been in the news, but it is what it is. Shaka Khan talking about Mary J. Blige's approach to sweet things. And then you down, you have down here in the bottom corner, BNGB. I put her in it because BNGB for her 1991 album, she did a version of Sweet Thing as well. Now, BNGB, you know, she was over there busted records with MC Hammer. So, of course, you know what they did to the version. They busted up. <laughs> like, and what I mean, they hip hopped it. You know, they tried to be a hip hop, some kind of version of the song. And BNGB is such a great singer. This is probably a prime example of what I've been talking about with songs where they try to, you know, do a whole different approach and a whole different spin on the song. And we're like, no, there was nothing wrong with uh, BNGB's vocals. Like she could have tore the song up if they kept it in its original version. But for whatever reason, during the time in 1991, they didn't want to do it. And so you have what you have with um, BNGB's version. Mary J. Blige's version, I like her version. It is what it is. You know, they kind of spiked the uh, hip hop her version up a little bit too as well. But of course, we already know who wins, Shaka Khan. You know, I like Shaka Khan's version. It's just what it is, you know? Yeah. Chum. I know, 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 I know y'all, I know, it's all right, it's all right. <sighs> we have Kelly Price and Shirley Murdoch as we lay. I, Shirley Murdoch put her funk on the song. Why touch it as we lay? And it's, I, I, yeah, I know, I know. But Kelly Price, for whatever reason, you know, Kelly, you can sing, Kelly. And Kelly can sing. You can sing that. You can tear it up, too. You can sing it just as good as Shirley Murdoch. Well, maybe you didn't. <laughs> and what I'm saying is, we all know, we're not talking about Kelly Price vocally. We're not. We're not talking about Kelly Price. But this is going to be another example, another example of what I was saying in the beginning. Baby, just because you can sing don't mean that you can sing. See, some artists out there probably saying to themselves, I can't sing. I really can't sing. I think I can sing better than her. And that's fine. But you have to understand, any artist can make a song theirs to the point where it's kind of like, Baby, you, they did it. And Shirley Marks, excuse me, Shirley Murdoch's version of As We Lay, nobody should ever touch it. It's kind of like that Patti LaBelle. If only you knew, a lot of divas have tried and maybe even men. Leave it alone. When you try to record it for a record, now, go on out there and sing it all day long. You can go out there to your shows and sing it during your shows all day long, but don't think you're going to come up in here and try to re-record it. Some songs you just don't need to touch. Like Shaka Khan's Through the Fire. Now, I don't know if someone else has sung a re-recorded Through the Fire after Shaka Khan, but if they did, I'm like, why? I'm like, no, I'm not. No. But we want to, well, get Shaka Khan to sing through the fire because I'm not going to sing through the fire. You know, y'all ain't going to put me in the fire. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. 
So anyway, I don't like Kelly Price's version of a production of the song, first of all. Like, I'm like, baby, you should have kept the same production. I know you need to, you know, change it up, make it more of the times. Like, but you lose an audience when you do that. I don't have to change it for, you know, the current music and what's being played on radio. No. So I was fine as it was. Shirley Murdoch wins. It's what it is. Kelly Price, we love you. We're not dissing. There's no shade, none of that over here. Just Kelly Price, I don't know what you was thinking. Right? And then to do the production part and have to sit back, I would have been like, no, we, uh-uh. Shirley Murdoch's version. We need her production style. Oh, I just, y'all have gave me a headache now. <laughs> it's got a headache. Ooh, child, y'all just. All right, we're back with Ron Osley. Now, you might not remember this group. It's all right. They showed up in 1990 with their second album, Easy to Love. And the group is Body. Do I remember those sisters? I mean, I'm talking about their name. I remember the group had the album, Easy to Love album. Francina, Peggy, and Latitia. Latitia, Body. Like their last name is Body. A group from Detroit. Detroit, Michigan. Right? On MCA Records. Well, at the time, Angela Wimbush had a production deal with MCA Records, and she had a production deal with Atlantic Records during that time, like in the 1989, 1990, 91, 92. You know, she did. And of course, you already know, you know, she and Ron Isley, they were, uh, well, let's say they was an item, and he managed Angela Wimbush. So, Luell Salas Jr. calls her up and pretty much says, hey, I got a girl group. I think you probably would be, you know, interested in producing. And so she produces four tracks on the uh, Easy to Love, on Body's Easy to Love album. Footsteps in the Dark, which was a remake of the Isley Brothers. The song called Body, another song called Love Me, Love Me Not, and another song called In the Morning, right? Well, anyway, check the video out. The ladies have a video of Footsteps in the Dark. And I think the song probably hovered around the top 20, maybe somewhere R&B number 18, number 15. Anyway, having said all of that, Ron Isley also did some assistant production on the record of Body's version of Easy to, not Easy to Love, but Footsteps in the Dark. And Angela Wimbush also uh, produced that record uh, for this group. She changed it up a little bit too. You know, she spiced it up, kind of changed it up, hipped it up, so on and so forth. Very much in Angela Wimbush's heavy sync, uh, falling keyboard type style. That she has, that she's known for, definitely, you know, there. Ron Isley is definitely there on the background vocals, you know, uh, uh, doing some ad libs uh, on this track, "Footsteps in the Dark." I think I like. Body's vocals better. Yeah, I said it vocals. I think I like Body's vocals better on the song, but I like the Osley Brothers production better. So it's kind of a tie. It depends on what mood I'm in. If I'm a mood, in, if I'm in a mood where I'm trying to get everybody involved into liking the song, you know, if I'm playing the song. I'm pretty sure everybody's going to like the Isley Brothers version better, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to win over some new people with Body if I play they if I play Body's version of Footsteps in the Dark. So it depends. Production, Isley Brothers. Vocals, Body. That's how I feel. It's just what it is. I didn't know. I did not know this. I didn't know it. I I didn't know that Reba McIntyre has a version of On My Own, but we'll talk about that in a minute. What I also didn't know was is that On My Own is a song that while it was made popular by Patti LaBelle, Dionne Warwick recorded it first. Then Patti LaBelle recorded it and of course made it what we know it 
of it today. Michael McDonald and Patti LaBelle, that song was like number one all over the place. I think it's a platinum single. I think uh, it was a platinum single. I think the uh, Patti LaBelle album for MCA, Winner and You, was a multi-platinum album for her. It, it's just what it was. But come to find out, Dionne Warwick version is the first version. And then Reba McIntyre showed up. And when I heard Reba McIntyre's version, I was like, this hell fucking sing. Like, I like Reba McIntyre's version, too. But, of course, you know, Patti LaBelle wins in this category. Check out who does Reba McIntyre. She does a version with, who is it, Trisha Yearwood? Wood. Isn't it Trisha Yearwood? Right, y'all. Trisha Yearwood. I don't know all of those ladies, but I do know uh, Reba McIntyre uh, is uh, singing on it. Isn't she? I think she is. Reba McIntyre. What's that other lady name? Because I was shocked when I found out that she actually did a version of that song. And I can't think of uh, who it is. I think Trisha Yearwood. I'm, I'm going to say Trisha Yearwood. It's three of them. But Reba McIntyre does a great uh, version of it. Check out all three. You know, that's the purpose of this. Check them out. Moving right along. Who's next? This is always controversial. <laughs> It's always controversial. I don't, I, I, I don't understand why it, this is such a controversial topic when we're talking about Jennifer Holliday and Jennifer Hudson. <laughs> you know, Jennifer Hudson's version of And I Am Telling You is great. We love it. But you... D <sighs> Jennifer Holliday put her funk, her stonk, on this one, like, I just don't understand why people are just not giving her the credit that she deserved, Jennifer Holiday. You know, I know what you're going to say. Oh, Jennifer Holiday has gotten older and vocally sometimes in certain parts of the performance, you go like, okay, Jennifer, okay, don't try so hard. Now, you ain't the 80s, Jennifer, or the 90s, Jennifer. You know, you're the 2023 Jennifer. You know, <laughs> you got older and the voices, but... She still does well, Jennifer Holiday, and I still say I'm going to Jennifer Holiday's version all the time. It's what it is. She she it's a done deal. I don't know why it's, a, it's so controversial. It's, it shouldn't be, but you did great, Jennifer Hudson. We appreciate you, but you're not Jennifer Holiday, you know. So we're going to move on from you, because I, I don't even want to discuss this. I'm, I've been here too long. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, y'all. I know, I know, I know, I know. Ladisi, Ladisi, and Lupe, Luther Vandross. My sensitivity. Yeah. Ladisi, we like your version. It's it's cool. You 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 did it. That's how we became known of you. At least I did. And you know, showing up on Michael based and after dark. By the way, performances was off the chain. You know, I think you had a song called In the Morning or something like that. But anyway, but Lupe, my sensitivity, it belongs to him. He's the first. This is the first time I didn't choose an R&B diva in this. Okay, well, that's what it is. Yeah, just the wrong song. The wrong song. I think if you would have recorded another song by Luther, you probably would have been like, okay, we can take your version. You know, like Layla Hathaway did with uh, Forever Far Away Said For Love. But no, nah, we're not going to discuss this any further. And I'm actually in an hour. I'm, I didn't think this was going to take me that long. But anyway... I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know how some of you guys feel, especially you new folks, you know, you 2,000 people, you know. I don't appreciate old school music. So some of you guys are going to say, oh, I like a Avance and Kiki Wyatt version of My First Love more than I like Renee and Angela. 
Well, listen to both songs, first of all, before you say that. And what we appreciate about Avant and Kiki Wyatt's version of My First Love is that they did not deviate from the original track, none whatsoever. Like, I mean, they'd stuck to it. Thank you for doing that. And I think that's the reason why the song was such a big hit, because it could, it, those of us who knew the song was a remake, we was like, oh, well, okay. Y'all didn't try to change anything. It was like, okay, we got you. We got you. We got you, Avani Kiki. We gonna support you. Yeah, Kiki, you're no Angela. And I ain't say you was trying to be, even though she got some octaves on her too, just like Angela. But they just got in there and did what they did and they sung and recorded it. And I think they did a wonderful, fantastic job. But of course, I'm giving it to Renee and Angela. It is what it is. Feel how you want to feel. It is what it is. Feel how you want to feel. It is what it is. But Renee and Angela's version is better. And I just don't understand why when you hear both versions that you don't automatically go more towards Renee and Angela. And I think you don't gravitate towards these artists like that is because of the time. I think people are probably want to stick more to the time they're in and say, I like this version better than an other than, than, than the older version because I guess it kind of makes you feel kind of old and you want to stay hip. Ah, stay true to the music. So Renee Moore and uh, Angela Wimbush, y'all, y'all have a better. If you ask me to, Celine Dion in Patti LaBelle, let me just put it to you this way. If I'm not mistaken, this is another thing that just caught me by surprise. If you ask me to, if I'm not mistaken, that was on one of the James Bond movies, right? And we know that the James Bond movies always have like this, um, the James Bond theme song. So I'm guess I'm questioning why this song just in it and of itself was not a big version. I mean, a big song for Patti LaBelle because she would have been like the James Bond girl, right? She and Gladys Knight. Hmm. I think this was more political than anything. And what I mean by this, I think it's the record company politics. I think that they just put Patti LaBelle in a box by this time. She was just in a box, you know, with R&B audiences is what it was. Um, and Celine Dion, you know, she's, of course, she's out. She's already being marketed towards pop, you know, audiences. And I think they just threw all the money behind her. Wonderful, great single, great voice, so on and so forth. So I just think that she was just marketed to win regardless is what it is. Whose version I like better? I think I like Petal LaBelle's vocals better, if that makes sense. I just like Petal LaBelle singing it. That's what it is. We're going to move right along. We ain't going to change it. I think this one is it, isn't it? Okay. Well, I guess it was going to take an hour. Hmm. I was kind of torn. Do I put up Layla Hathaway's version of Forever, Far Away, and For Love? <laughs> or do I put up Layla Hathaway's version of Angel? Now, if I did Forever, Far Away, and For Love, I think she would have lost out. But her version of Angel, she does it so smoky. I mean, it's 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 just very, yeah, very smoky. If I could, very, 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 yeah. I like her version of Angel. But I'm definitely going to choose Anita Baker's version over hers all the time. I think what makes Layla Hathaway wins in this instance. Like her version, I like her version better. It's just her vocal approach. Because again, she didn't change the music at all. Thank you. You didn't do that. Thanks, uh, thanks to the producer who didn't do that. 
the production team, thank you. It was her vocals that just really and truly made it what it what it became. And with Forever for Always and for Love, I think she tried to stay consistent with Luther Vandross, even vocally. Mm -mm. See, that's why you went out in this category. It's the vocals. It's definitely the vocals. Well, I do believe this is it. I think this is it. Well, thank you so much for staying the whole hour, the 50 minutes over here with me talking about whose version was best. I didn't anticipate on taking as long as I did, but just so happened I did anyway. So again, thank you so much for liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, so on and so forth. And remember over here at Pippin Love View, we believe, I believe in you putting your behind where your heart desires to be. Not only that, Whenever I leave my mother's presence, she always says to me, baby, remember, I love you, but God loves you best. And I'm saying I love you too today. And I look forward to seeing you next video. And until then, you know what you should do. Take care of yourselves out there. <laughs> Talk to you later.